Imagine, imagine this, a family member, a loved one, is diagnosed with cancer, has to go to the hospital for an extended stay. What happens? What happens to them? Cards are delivered, flowers are delivered, visits, phone calls to the rest of the family at home. The casserole crowd crumbs to visit them. They get things. Now imagine that same individual is admitted into a hospital on a mental illness diagnosis. What happens? Nothing. This is the state where we're in. This is what needs to change. In law enforcement, we see a lot of stuff, which we call junk sometimes. Tragedies, horrors. Things like a young woman, a teenager, who just broke up with her boyfriend. So distraught, she comes up to the bridge, speak with her for several hours, build that rapport, and then she takes her life. And we see that lifeless body in the water. It has a great impact on you. These things go on and on and on. The things that we see, the children involved in auto accidents, the victims of abuse. It takes a heavy, heavy toll on us in the form of PTSD that we've all heard about. What happens? What really happens with this? How does it affect us? Intrusion. In your mind, it keeps coming back. You keep replaying this time and time again, this invasiveness in your head. You begin to avoid things. You want to avoid the thought, the place, the people, the smells, the sights. The hyper-arousal we get with this. Always a very difficult time concentrating, thinking about things, sleeping. All of this accumulates. Compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma, cumulative effects on us, long-lasting effects that we don't talk about. Cynicism. Think of the grouchiest individual at your office. Been there a long time, very cynical, everything's always wrong. More than likely, a sufferer of compassion fatigue. Angry outbursts, self-destructive behaviors, reckless behaviors, the drinking of alcohol, we see that time and time again. Relationship problems. We, as law enforcement as a whole, have a very, very high divorce rate. And sometimes we get this negative self-image. 5, 10, 15 years on the job, all these things that we've seen, they take an effect that, am I really doing a good job out there? I don't think I am. But every year, you're getting a fantastic rating. But in your mind, I don't think I'm doing very good. Let me tell you a little bit about myself, how this major depressive disorder that I've been diagnosed with happened over time, over quite a long time. Right out of high school, I went into the United States Army. My second year in the Army, I developed cancer, testicular cancer. It was never spoken about back then. I thought maybe I did something to cause this. It was shameful. I never talked about this, ever, up until maybe four or five years ago. My mother passed away from cancer at just 49 years old. Hit the family extremely hard. We were all gathered around here. She died at home um, right with us. We see her last breath. I close her eyes. I rode a motorcycle for the highway patrol, retired as the motor sergeant. You know you're going to go down. It's a matter of how hard and if you're going to get back up. An individual one time on a county road, very windy road, came around a corner way too hot on another motorcycle and hit me head on. It was determined the closing speed was around 105 miles an hour. I was out for several months, 
had that traumatic brain injury, that concussion, all these things can turn into mental illness, and it did. I had heart surgery when I was 48 years old. Three stents placed in my heart. It wasn't the stents, it wasn't the, the procedure that was bad. It was when that doctor comes in and tells you there's something wrong with your heart. That brought the tears to my eyes. Will I ever see my two boys again? Very, very rough. And unfortunately, I did get a divorce. Two little boys. My ex-wife wrote a note, a suicide note, to each of my boys. I was looking up how to load a gun on the computer. All of this, plus more, took a heavy hit on my heart, my body, my soul. This is what happened to me. I would go to work and function at 100%. But when I went home, when I had nothing to do, when I didn't have to do anything, I didn't. I sat on a couch two, three, four days, didn't play with the dogs, didn't play with the kids, didn't do anything. Very, very strange. And I didn't recognize this for a long, long time because I would go to work and function at 100%. Finally, just through a routine medical checkup with my family doctor who knows my history, I tell him, I don't know what's going on here, doc. I'm not feeling right. He has me take a little test, personal health questionnaire, and I flunked it pretty good, diagnosed with depression. He comes in and talks to me about it, and he goes, Kevin, it's my opinion you have depression. How do you feel about this? How do you think I feel about this? Look at this laundry list, and now I have depression on top of this. So he prescribed me medication. Seems to be working. My youngest one, I have two boys, age 12 and 14. My 12-year-old sees this slide, looks at all this, and he goes, Dad, you're going to be fine the rest of your life. You're not even going to have a cold. Nothing's going to happen to you. You're going to be great. I said, wow, his name's Travis. I, go, well, I call him T-Man. T-Man, how do you know this? He goes, well, Dad, look at that slide. He goes, there's no more room. <laughs> oh, thank you, little T-Man. So here's the important part, a few of things. One, I do not talk about myself when I'm talking to someone who is contemplating taking their life. It is not about me. It is not the Kevin Briggs Show. It is about them. I don't talk about myself. It is solely about them. Why did I not seek help? And this is for many, many folks why we don't in law enforcement. Denial. I was in denial. I cannot have a mental illness will, will not happen to me. Can't. Well, the shame. I thought, I thought I would lose friends and I would lose my job. Absolutely wrong. That is very, very important. I did not lose friends and I did not lose my job. I gained many friends. And also thinking that the problem would go away in time. When it won't, it can just get worse. After all this took place, I really took a look at my life and say, you know what? I got to get my act together a little more. As caregivers, first responders, cops, firemen, we give, 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 but we fail to see what's happening to us and we fail to see what's happening to our families. But this is what I came up with for me. My quality of life triad starts with myself on the top. I need to, if I can, pull up my own bootstraps. And that entails going to the gym, eating healthy, seeing whoever I need to for my support to keep my head clear. I started doing meditation. I started doing transcendental meditation, which seems to work, lowers my blood pressure, um, helps because I take a lot of medicine for a lot of things, helps me remember things. My professional care, not just a psychologist, psychiatrist, anybody in a profession that can help you. My instructor, my TM instructor, professional. My boys are half Japanese. I want them, and it's very important for me, to me, that they retain that culture. So we take Aikido, a Japanese martial art. My sensei, a professional, things like that, and also that building block is support. That's something that was there for me that I never took advantage of. 
I didn't say all these things are wrong with me to get this out. I never talked about it. They were weaknesses and flaws, and I cannot do that. I was in the Army. I worked at San Quentin, and now I'm a motor with the Highway Patrol. We are the strongest, the best around. I do not and will not have a weakness. That's what happened. It knocked me in the dirt. This is my other little boy, Kevin Jr. He's 14 now. I retired from the California Highway Patrol two years ago this month to travel and be afforded this ability to talk about mental illness and suicides. Last year in August, I was flying back home and I landed at San Francisco International Airport, turned on my cell phone, and there's a message from little Travis. And I thought it would be, welcome home, Dad. Glad you're here, stop by our house on the way back. But it wasn't. It was little Travis screaming on there, Dad, you need to get here quick. Kevin broke an iPad, he's in the backyard, and he says he's going to kill himself. All right, I thought a little bit of drama there, but I'm still going to go up there and see what's going on, of course. So I start responding up to the house, takes about an hour. On my way up, I get a couple of texts from little Travis, and he's saying, Dad, you need to get here quick, but when you do, say nice things to Kevin. Say nice things to Kevin. Don't be angry. All this coming from a little 12-year-old. I make my way to the house. In the house is my sister, my ex, and little Travis, and I call him baby boy, which he hates. He is in the backyard, in the dark, just pacing back and forth. I watch him for a little bit, just to see what's going on with him, and he's just pacing back and forth. I walk out there, I put my hand on his shoulder, and I go, hey, baby boy, what's going on? And he breaks down, breaks down to the point he can barely stand. Wow, really took me by surprise. I've never seen my kids like this. We went and stayed in that backyard in the dark and talked for a long time all the things that were going on. He openly spoke to me. I had not discussed my divorce with him. I was ashamed and embarrassed. He thought he was the cause of it. He had nothing to do with it, but in his little head, he caused this. It really impacted me. I failed on that. There were some folks in his school that started to do marijuana. He wanted nothing, nothing to do with that. He's a big-time soccer player. We travel all over. Just a few weeks ago, we went to Las Vegas for a soccer tournament. I don't know why a 14-year-old needs to go to Las Vegas when we live up north of San Francisco, but that's where it is. So, he goes on. I did not think I was pushing him for good grades, but he said I was. So I was. We decided... We better get some professional help. We go to see a counselor. On the day of the appointment, we walk in. I ask baby boy, do you want me in the room with you? He says, yes, dad. Okay. I asked the counselor, would you like me in the room with you? Is it okay? He says, yes, sir. Come on in. And I explain to him what I do and what I did before. So he knows in case there's some suicide ideation there. So we go in and the counselor's here little baby boy's over there, and I'm off to the left. He starts asking him all sorts of basic questions and how his life is at school and at home and what he likes and doesn't like about everybody in the family. And baby boy's being very forthright. He's doing very good. And then he asked little Kevin, have you ever hurt yourself intentionally? And baby boy does this. Like he stuck himself with a pen or a pencil. I knew exactly what this was. I turned my head. I was tearing up. Very, very difficult. Turns out, in my mind, this is a cutter. This is a kid, non-suicidal self-injury, NSSI. We see it all the time. It's happening to my family. And I tell you, as first responders, we miss things going on with us. I miss this little kid happening to him. It was tough. Then the counselor goes, you're not going to commit suicide, are you? What an extremely crappy way of asking that question. If I'm going to talk to someone, of getting into that act, leading into that, first I'm going to build rapport, we're going to go somewhere where no one is, and I will ask them like this, have you been having thoughts of killing yourself? Let them answer it. Do not ask it like he did. 
He answered it for that little kid. That's an adult to a little kid. Answered it for him. Then it gets worse. He turns to me and he goes, did I cover all the bases? I don't know, did you? Horrible, horrible stuff. We get done with that appointment and I asked to speak with him. And I really debated this because he has all the degrees. I have nothing but experience. But I told him, this isn't really how we do it and how I've been trained and I went through the FBI school and everything else. This is how we asked that. And he was embarrassed and he didn't have that ego. Ego is the worst thing in negotiations. It really is, in my opinion. He accepted all this and we stayed with him. And little Kevin is doing wonderfully now. But I found out this. I started doing some research. In a 2013 study in the University of Washington, 50% of psychologists, 25% of social workers, 6% of counselors have training in suicide assessment. I was floored by this. This is what you do. I did not know this. Please remember this if this happens in your family. Take charge of this. Now, this little boy who I almost lost, I ask him, what do you want to do on vacation? I'm thinking, let's go to Yosemite. Let's go to Disneyland. Nope. Dad, I want to go to England and watch a soccer game. Okay, let me do some overtime. <laughs> so this is how this stands now. So what I'm asking you and imploring you, please take care of yourself, take care of your family, and take care of each other at work. Thank you very much. Hi, this is Roy Bethke from the Virtus Group and co-founder of WinX. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and I'm hopeful that you found it valuable. Our goal with WinX is to encourage each of us in the profession to think, train, prepare, behave, lead, and live differently. For that to happen, we need your help. If you found the video helpful in any way, please take a moment to share it. You can do that on social media, especially Facebook and Twitter, on the internet, or within your network of like-minded people. Also, we have similar videos available from all of our events. You'll find them posted on the Virtus Group YouTube page. We think the videos are a great tool for learning, but feedback has told us that there is nothing better than being at a WinX event in person. Nine presenters, 18 minutes each, designed to inspire and engage the audience. To get more information about our next WinX event, including location, cost, and registration, please visit www.experiencewinx.com. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com experiencewinx or on Twitter at AskWinX. Until next time, be safe and remember life's most powerful question, what's important now? Thank you.